Well, it's time for another tutorial, and in this video we're going to discuss a very commonly asked question about what to do after you've made a, a life cast, uh, typically a hand cast. We have a lot of people who uh, follow our tutorials for molding hands of relatives and things like that, and uh, the logical extension of that is once you've got that uh, positive of someone's hand in hydrostone or hydrocal or what have you, how to reproduce that because again even if you're not doing this for production casting a lot of you may be doing this for relatives so uh, it makes sense that uh, the next step is typically to make a mold of the life cast hands or the positive. So in this tutorial we're going to take a hand cast this is a, a Hydrostone hand cast pulled from a uh, 380, AccuCast 380 hand mold. And this has been cleaned up and uh, clayed up in some areas with deep undercuts. And now the next step is to make a mold of this. And obviously in this instance, the whole point of that is to be able to re reproduce this for uh, relatives and uh, or if you were so inclined to, if you had such a beautiful hand cast, you wanted to make a uh, production mold to produce 20, 30, 40 copies, whatever, um, you could also do that. But typically, again, like this, is typically going to be used to produce copies for other relatives. Um, so again, even if we're just going to make two or three, we still need a good quality mold that we can use to produce multiple hand casts. So again, in this tutorial, we're gonna go through the process of making a mold of a hand cast, and then, uh, and along the way, discuss some of the uh, reasoning behind a, the mold approach we're going to use for this hand cast, because um, again, that's one of those things that I see a lot that we get a lot of questions about in our store is uh, the why of it all. Okay, why would you choose that particular mold method for that part? What's the thinking there? So we're going to get right into that. Okay, now again, to begin with, we have our, our hand casts in Hydrostone. And I've gone ahead and just glued these down with some hot glue to a piece of foam core board that gives us a, a, a relatively uh, stable work surface here. And foam core board is just an excellent material for making quick baseboards like this. Obviously we could use a piece of plywood, uh, but this is not something we need to be permanent. We just need to be able to move this around and tilt it a few times during the molding and casting process. So uh, overall foam core board is perfect for our, our intent here. Now, here is probably the most important consideration of a mold like this. Because these hands, these are taken from an, uh, an older couple and there's a lot of very intricate skin surface detail and we want to do our best to preserve that as well as possible. So one thing we have to look at is where a good place for a seam might be. Um, because we can't really do this seamless if we were just to coat this whole thing with silicone and then try to pull it off like a glove, it's going to catch because obviously we have an opening right here. So the two important things we have to think about is one is uh, what is our casting material going to be? And we want to work backward from that. So say we're doing cold cast bronze or uh, or some kind of resin cast piece like this, or more hydrostone. Again, we want minimal cleanup on this because we could put seams on this, but uh, again, since this is going to be something that we're gonna clean up and finish, we want to minimize those seams if at all possible. So what I've decided here is I'm actually going to make kind of a combination of a one piece mold with a seam down here. So what I'm going to do is a one piece jacket that's gonna come out here, give myself a nice perimeter, and I'm going to actually fill this area in down here. And what that's going to do is give me a thick area later to cut in with an X-Acto knife to open this up. So what our piece will do, our mold will actually open up kind of like a clamshell around this part right here. And you can see it a little better from the side there. So it opens up but there's no seam here or here. So that means our seam is on the easiest part to hide. So that will allow the mold to open kind of like a clamshell and pull off. 
and thereby eliminating a lot of cleanup work that we would otherwise have to do uh, if we put a seam here or here. And again, the main thing is even no matter how well done a seam is, that still necessitates some cleanup later on. And cleanup along these fingertips would be tricky. Not impossible, but tricky. So again, if we can save ourselves that work, that's always a good idea. So for this mold, we want something fairly soft and stretchy. And again, since we're going to probably be doing a cold cast resin uh, with metal powder, by minimizing those seams, that also allows us to uh, uh, do that metal casting with minimal cleanup on the outside of that. So, um, so that's probably one of the most important considerations is we need a silicone mold and we need something soft and stretchy that could pull out and around of, off of our hands. Okay, now for our silicone mold, we're going to use one of our new silicone formulas. This is the XP727Q kind of a convoluted name, but excellent stretchy silicone. It's a very soft, stretchy silicone formula that cures really fast, so it's ideal for this kind of glove mold, and it responds to silicone thickener. So that's also an important detail because uh, for this mold, we're gonna put a couple of coats on fairly runny, but we need to make sure we're able to thicken this up to fill undercuts. So that's where the Thixo comes into play. Now. As with any brush on mold, we'll need to follow that up with a mother mold with a hard shell over the top. And in this instance, this is a simple enough mold and because this is a relatively seamless mold other than right here, we can do the shell for this with a plaster bandage mother mold. So all of these are things we want to think through well in advance. And if you're new to this process, if you're new to molding parts like this, it's a really good exercise in visualizing every step. Make sure just set your piece out in front of you and visualize every step that you're gonna take this through and make sure you have a plan of attack for every part of it and make sure that you've allocated the right products and the right process for every part of the process. If you don't, you can very easily wind up in a situation where you make a beautiful mold that's not compatible with what you're going to be casting into it. So real important, cannot stress enough, but always have a good plan for exactly what you're going to do. And if you're new to this process, make sure you write down all of your steps, write down a shopping list of all the materials you're, you'll be needing, and that will greatly minimize your stress as you move through, the, through this process. Now, before we start our application of silicone, it's important that we apply our mold release to both the, the, the piece that we're going to mold as well as our baseboard to make sure we don't have our silicone trying to grab onto that. Now, overall, silicone is really good about not sticking to most of these surfaces, but we want to aid in the demold process, make sure everything comes out as clean as possible so we don't have to do a lot of cleanup to the mold after the fact. So to do that, we're going to be using the Super Release PTR, also known as Eject It 33. This is a good general purpose mold release for making silicone molds, and it doesn't take much. Again, our main purpose here, the main thing I'm more concerned about is down here at the baseboard, I want that to clean off, peel off really clean. And remember, any time you apply a release agent like this, anything like this that comes in an aerosol can or is a solvent-based release, make sure you give it time to dry and outgas completely. Because right now, because of the carrier solvents in this release, if we immediately start pouring or brushing silicone on, we'll wind up with little pinhole bubbles all over the inside of the mold where that uh, is trying to escape, where those gases are building up. So make sure you give that time to outgas and dry completely before you proceed with your silicone application. Okay, we're now ready to mix up our silicone. And our first layer that we're going to put on is just going to be a runny layer of what we call our print coat. That's just there to establish all the detail and get one cohesive layer all over the part. Now overall, what we're shooting for with a brush on mold like this, we're shooting for about a quarter of an inch average thickness. Now, some places are gonna be a little bit thicker around deep undercut areas. 
and some places might be a little bit thinner. But that's our overall goal is to be at about a quarter of an inch thick. We don't want it too thick because when we go to demold this uh, silicone mold, we don't want it so thick that it takes a lot of effort to turn it back on itself. So this is one of those instances where less is more. Don't build it up thicker than it has to be. Now the other thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to add a little bit of silicone pigment. You might have seen this in some previous videos. We're just going to add a little bit of the blue silicone pigment and that just helps us track our progress so we can see that everything is totally covered. Because as it is, the 727 is a translucent silicone, so everything's just gonna be a big glossy mess until our mold really starts to take shape. So that'll really help us track our progress to have a little bit of pigment in there. Now, again, this is uh, the number of layers is not as important as that overall thickness. So don't think of this like an air drying material where you, you need to keep each layer really thin so that it completely dries. We could build this up a half inch uh, to an inch thick in one layer if we're so inclined. But here we wanna make sure we move carefully so we don't have a lot of air bubble entrapment on that surface. Now this is measured out one to one by weight. And I'm just measuring out 100 grams of part A and 100 grams of part B. And it is a little unnerving when you're starting out measuring out in one mixing cup, but I assure you with patience and practice this can be done. And uh, even, even starting out, if you're very careful and you get used to how the material behaves, uh, doing this all in one mixing cup is not a problem at all. Now remember with silicone pigment, it is very concentrated. So it does not take much to get, the, uh, get a good rich color. And again, we're not so much, the, the point of the pigment is not so much for any kind of aesthetic reason, but so that we can track our progress. Now you'll see I have a, uh, a chip brush set aside here and this is, this is so I can apply my silicone. And as soon as this is done, this chip brush goes away to brush heaven. So uh, remember each brush that is used in this process is going to be uh, disposable, is going to need to be thrown away. I do have some customers that are very committed to uh, using their brushes as much as possible. But just remember the amount of solvent that it takes to clean out a brush like this is such that you very quickly lose any benefit from that. So just be aware of that. Now we have a relatively fast working time on this. So we wanna move quick, make sure everything gets stirred up. And then we're ready to go ahead and pour that over our part. And the reason I'm pouring this instead of just brushing right out of the uh, bucket is so that I use gravity to help me apply the, the material to the part. And then I just steer that with the brush as it drips down the piece. And again, re remember that uh, this is where it's good to have your part properly anchored so that you can get in there and if you have to, tilt the piece around and make sure that you get all the little nooks and crannies and you don't have a big void or a big air bubble hiding someplace because you will definitely find it later. And again, that's where the silicone pigment really helps a lot in tracking your progress. So any place where you see that raw plaster or hydrostone, that's a good indicator you haven't hit that yet. <laughs> 
So again, if we have to, if we have to tilt this back to get into a particular area, we can do that because we've got this anchored with foam the, to the foam core board. You can always use your brush to recycle some of that silicone back up to the top and let it run down again. Okay, we're done applying our silicone. I've got everything applied all over the piece, and now we're just gonna let that drip a little bit. We don't wanna keep brushing this till it sets up. Uh, that, that can create little air bubbles and voids and little blisters where your brush starts to grab on the silicone. So once you've got your silicone applied, back off and let that just drip and start to gel on its own. And remember that what is in your mixing bucket over here is a good indicator of what's happening on your mold. So you can use this to check your work. And when this is set up enough to apply a second coat, then you're ready to proceed. But that will, this will eliminate the need to start touching your, your piece. Okay, so this particular silicone, the 727, has a, around a 20 minute working time at room temperature and about a one hour demold. Um, so, at this point, we're, we're about 30 minutes uh, after our first coat is applied, and we're ready to test this to see if it's ready to accept another coat. Now again, if you've watched our other tutorials, especially uh, some of the stuff on our uh, brush-on mold making page on our video library, you're familiar with this technique. I usually use the, the, uh, uh, my fingernail to tap a puddle, and when I can do that without removing material on my fingernail, then I know I'm ready to proceed. Now the reason for using your fingernail there and not the pads of your fingers is that eliminates that uh, transfer of any kind of surface oils from the surfaces of your hands onto the piece. So again, we want to uh, uh, eliminate any potential for contaminating that mold and creating delamination. What that is, delamination is any time we transfer oil or release agent or anything onto a piece like this that then causes those layers to come apart later on. So we wanna make sure we get a good bond between each layer of silicone that we apply. Okay, we're now ready to mix up our second layer of silicone. And I'm gonna go ahead and double it. Uh, this was 200 grams for this batch. So I'm gonna do 200 grams of part A and 200 grams of part B for our second layer. Now for our second layer, it's important that we add our thickener to this layer and also some more pigment. So I'm gonna add some red just for a nice contrast here. And then I'm going to add just a about 1% of thickening agent. And what that does is converts this from a pourable liquid to a fixotropic paste. So think pourable liquid being like a honey consistency versus peanut butter. Peanut butter is typically a fixotropic material that uh, you have to push it around with a trowel or a brush to get it to move. Gravity on its own won't affect it. And that's real important for applying to a vertical surface like this. And again, remember our 20 minute working time starts as soon as those two components go together. And again, remember that our brush, you want to make sure you're using a disposable brush because any brush that touches this will be destroyed. Now here I'm go starting at the bottom of the piece and I'm going to work up. And the reason for this, uh, in contrast to that first layer where I started at the top and worked down, is because this is thickened, uh, it's going to have a tendency to trap air bubbles if I'm not careful. So by starting at the bottom and working up, I can make sure that I get those little air, air bubbles, any of those uh, little gaps filled in 
with uh, a, hopefully without trapping any air bubbles between that first and second coat. So again, you want to just take care to uh, push that all around and fill in all of those little undercut areas. And again, the reason we like to work from the bottom up on this coat is because if it if you get a glob of this that falls down, you don't want that uh, creating a void that uh, you don't realize is there until you go to demold the, the part. Now, because this is uh, that does have that fixotropic quality, we can come in there and really fill in some of these areas like this. And you'll notice that uh, any excess I've got down here at the bottom, I'm using to create a nice thick flange on my piece. And at this point, once we've started uh, applying this enough that we can, we've started simplifying the form, you can start to see the areas that will naturally need to be filled in in order for the mother mold to come apart. Because other, we, what we want to do is create a somewhat abstract form here. And you want to start to visualize that mother mold coming apart in two pieces. And think about any place has, that has a tendency to, uh, to grab onto that shell. And once we've applied as much as we can with the brush, we can transition to a trowel and use that to help square off some of these areas. But you can see already we're getting a nice thick layer applied. And right around this thumb, that's where we want to make sure that we get that coated really well and build that up nice and thick so that our shell doesn't lock onto that thumb area. Now what I'm doing here is just packing in that uh, open area with silicone. And I'm just going to pack it in from one side and then turn it around and check the other side and make sure that uh, we've got that completely filled. You can see that area right down there is what we're filling in. And I'm mainly packing it in from this side so that I can make sure that I have minimal entrapment of uh, air down there. Because we're going to have some air bubbles in there, but again, the more we can avoid that by pushing that in from one side, the cleaner that will be. And if need be, we can go back to the brush here. Again, I just want to make sure that that outside, that flange, is nice and clean. You can see I've got a little thin spot right up here I want to hit. And the rest of this we're going to fill in with our final layer. We're going to mix up the rest of that silicone here in a minute and come back and fill that all in. And that will complete our mold. So we just need a little bit more to fill in that area and we are good to go. But overall, we've got all the undercuts addressed. Just want to come back in here and make sure that I get all these little places smoothed out so that our shell doesn't grab onto any of those areas. And if you want to be 
real careful about your usage of silicone. You can always squeegee that off your brush. Again, we can use that just to smooth out any of those little undercut areas. Make that as clean as possible. Because think about it with your shell later on, if you've got any little wispy, like little meringue looking peaks in your silicone, not the end of the world, but all those little places are a potential for the mold to misalign later on. So we wanna make sure that our, our, we have a nice smooth form and a, a wide flange that'll help this align later going into our mother mold. Okay, once again, it's time to check and see if our piece is ready to proceed with the final coat. And for that, I'm gonna use my fingernail and just tap some of this excess silicone out here. And it's a little tacky, but again, it's not coming off on my fingernail, so we're ready to proceed. Okay, we're ready to mix up our final coat. What we've done here is we've, I've worked this out to use almost exactly every drop of a two pound kit of this uh, 727 silicone. So we might have been able to get away with a little bit less than this, but uh, a, a mold like this, you're probably gonna wind up using almost every drop of a two pound kit to do a, you know, to mold a couple of hands like this. So be aware of that. Um, if you are new to this process, it's always a good idea to work out of a light, slightly larger kit, just so you don't wind up using every last drop learning the product. Some of the sad stories we hear in our universe uh, of people who are undertaking their first mold and they buy barely enough to get the mold done and then have to scramble around to order more, hoping that it will all bond. So again, order a little bit more than you actually need to prevent that sadness. And it is profound and total sadness. Now, again, with this coat, we want this to be thickened to a brushable consistency. So we're gonna add some thick so to that. And we're also going to add more of our silicone pigment. So I'm gonna add a little bit of red and a little bit of blue, just so we can get us a nice violet color. And now ready to mix that up and add some of our thick so to it. It doesn't take much silicone thickener to uh, thicken this up to a nice brushable consistency. And again, our final layer here, we just want to, again, fill in the last bit of uh, that gap there and just go and tidy up the outside of the mold a little bit, make sure there's no undercut areas that uh, need to be filled in. And again, remember our working time starts as soon as those two components go together. So sometimes when people see a material like this that's uh, fairly fast setting, that has like a 20 minute working time. They think that working time starts when they start working. And the working time starts as soon as those chemicals go together. So just remember, the chemicals are stupid. They don't know what your intent is. So as soon as you put those two components together, that's when that time starts. Now, in addition to my disposable brush, I also have a little popsicle stick here and an extra stir stick to uh, help trowel this on. And again, just having a little bit of difference in color really helps us see where that material is going. And you see how we've just very easily troweled that in. And you can also see now at this point, our, our, the form of our piece has really become simplified. So we have a nice abstract shape with no little undercuts that, that uh, the shell is going to grab onto. So again, from this side right here, you can easily see how that side is going to demold. 
So basically it's going to part right along this horizon line and very easily pull cleanly off that side. And again, this is, uh, I've, I've done molds similar to this enough times that I know typically what the usage is going to be for a mold like this just by kind of eyeballing the part. But as you build up experience with that, again, remember that it's always a good idea to start off with more material than you need. So always work out of a bigger kit than you absolutely have to have just so you don't run out of material at a really important point in your process. And this last batch, just since I didn't say it earlier, this used about uh, 115 grams of A and B. 115 grams of part A and 115 grams of part B. So there we have our, our silicone applied there and we're just gonna make sure we scrape this out and use every last bit, mainly for around that thumb. I wanna make sure that I don't have any areas where that wants to grab on my shell. Again, don't be afraid to tilt it around, move your piece any way that it needs, needs to go to get access to uh, any of those undercut areas. Again, what I'm doing here is more just a little bit of housekeeping just to make sure that I don't have a lot of little wispy peaks of silicone that can create drag on that mother mold when it's being demolded. But more importantly, I don't want a lot of places that could create uh, uh, distortions if when I put this all back together, I don't want to have uh, some areas where this uh, misaligns because I've got a little lump of silicone that bent the wrong way as the shell went back together. There we have our finished mold. We have a nice smooth outside surface and again just a little last we just want to do a last minute check of all of our little um, undercut areas and make sure everything is properly finished out and just smooth everything out as much as possible. And remember, uh, you want to stop working before the end of that working time because if you keep monkeying with this as it starts to set up, it's not the end of the world, but uh, you can wind up creating some really funky areas Again, the exact stuff that you're trying to avoid, where you start getting these little peaks of like uh, meringue, these stringy areas that'll have to be trimmed off later on. So again, the more of this you could smooth out while you have plenty of working time, the better. So there we go. We're ready to leave it alone and let it set up the rest of the way. Now from this point on, from this time where we've got all of our silicone applied, to when we're ready to make our mother mold. Uh, it takes about an hour. So uh, it's a good idea. At this point, we're not up against the clock or anything for anything to stick to anything else. But uh, if you're trying to move along at a relatively quick pace, it's a good idea to set a timer so you, know, you don't have a lot of wasted downtime. So uh, we're gonna give this about an hour and then we're gonna come back and make our mother mold. Okay, so it's about an hour after our last coat. And again, always a good idea to check some insignificant part of the uh, silicone outside of the mold area, just to check and make sure everything is cured. And I'll always like to keep uh, what's left over in my uh, buckets handy for one thing it's much easier to clean out when everything has cured completely, but also it's a good way to check your work. So if everything comes out nice and clean, that's a good indication that uh, you've mixed everything properly. So barring some kind of cure inhibition on the surface of your model, you should be in the clear. So you see we have a nice, cohesive, thick, uh, 
silicone mold, I say thick, thick relative to this purpose. And again, it's real important, this is a common question I get a lot, is uh, how thick or how many layers does a, a mold like this need to be? And it's not so much how many layers as much as the overall average thickness. Because if you can make a mold that's accurate and bubble free in one layer, then so be it. But uh, you don't want to get tunnel vision about the number of layers because it's the overall thickness that you're going for. And here, again, we're going for a thickness of about uh, a quarter of an inch on average, a little bit thicker in some areas like here, and maybe a little thinner in some of these areas. But that's what we're shooting for on average so that we have a good, tough mold. And again, since this is a mold that's going to basically pull inside out, we don't want this to be too thick because that'll actually work against us. So you want to be careful not to build up excessive layers of silicone that don't need to be there. For one, it's expensive. And then second of all, when you go to demold this, that's actually going to work against you. So be very careful about that. Now ready to divide this up for our, our mother mold. And we can pretty much follow that horizon line right across the top here to make one piece come this way and one come this way. Now for our mother mold, we're just gonna keep this quick and simple and we're going to use plaster bandages. Now these are not to be confused with uh, hobby store plaster bandages like rigid wrap or some of the model railroad um, plaster material. These are professional for uh, medical applications and they have a much higher and stronger content of plaster. So you get a much stronger shell out of this than you do with some of the hobby store bandages. That's a real important detail. Now, one of the things we're gonna to need to establish is that horizon line over the part. So I'm gonna create one long bandage that's gonna cover that horizon. And then I'm gonna use the rest of this roll. And again, you can cut or tear these there. Uh, either one works great. Just uh, remember that when you tear them, they do create more dust. So if you're wanting to watch out and minimize the dust in your shop environment, then uh, it's a good idea to uh, cut those instead. Now you'll notice I layer these at least three layers thick. And the reason for that is that minimizes how much time I have to go back and forth to my water to uh, dip these to activate them. So by doing this about three layers thick and each layer overlapping about halfway over the previous uh, bandage, that gives me an overall thickness of about six layers thick. And that gives me a good strong mother mold. Now, one extra step, real important here, because we're making a two piece shell. We wanna make sure that the, the seam doesn't stick to itself. So to prevent that, we're going to be using some Pardol number two paste wax. And now that uh, uh, Johnson's paste wax is no more, uh, this is kind of the last man standing of the paste wax. This is an inexpensive paste wax that's great for keeping plaster from sticking to plaster. And I prefer this to petroleum jelly for this kind of application, just because this will dry. This will dry to create a nice wax barrier, whereas petroleum jelly stays kind of sticky and gooey. So this makes, for life casting, petroleum jelly is great because it doesn't put off any odor. But uh, when you're making mother molds, I really prefer the Pardol number two paste wax. Now I have an extra plaster bandage roll standing by. I'm gonna use that for the second half. We're gonna use just shy of two bandages total. And also real important, we're using just room temperature water to make this mother mold. But if you want this to go faster, you can always use warm water. Remember warm water will accelerate the plaster, whereas cold water will slow it down. Now, also, when you're working with plaster bandages, again, we want to maintain those three layers. So I always like to make sure I hold on to both ends. And then when you pull that out of the water, make sure you give it a good squeeze and squeeze out any of that excess water content. Now, you don't want to wring this. You don't want to, to dislodge that plaster content because that's what gives the bandage its strength but you do want to make sure that you don't pull this out and have it just be soaking wet. Now I'm going to fold that lengthwise and what that's going to do is give me a nice defined edge. 
and I'm just going to lay that edge right down across that horizon line. And again, I'm just following that high point of my piece. And now we just play fill in the blanks. Just come in and use this. Now here, I want that rough edge so I can feather that into that surrounding uh, bandage. But anywhere I have bandage material terminating, in, you know, into a, unless it's going to overlap down here like, like that edge, I want that to be doubled over so that it gives me a nice defined edge. And then I don't have uh, a lot of unsightly little raggedy edges later on. So again, here I'm going back and overlapping that uh, previous layer about halfway. And then any of that excess, I can just turn that right back at that edge to again, reinforce that seam. And bandage shells like this, these the mother molds made with plaster bandages, hold up remarkably well. If they're well made and you use good plaster bandages, I have mother molds made in this exact way with these exact bandages that uh, are over 20 years old. I'll have to dig one out just for the sake of the next video just to show you uh, how these age. So again, if the, if the provided it's the appropriate application for this, obviously I wouldn't recommend this for uh, concrete mold making or something like that that has a lot of uh, pressure on the mold but if you're doing rotational casting and that sort of thing this is great now what i'm going to do at this point is take my my thumb and my forefinger here and use that to create a nice defined edge you know how well you can see that here but that's one of the nice things about working with plaster is it hits a, a stage these bandages have a very sculptable quality to them so just using my fingers like that, I can create a nice defined edge. And I'm going to need that here in just a minute. As soon as that sets up, I can release that with my, my paste wax because that next layer, that next bandage shell, that second half is actually going to overlap ever so slightly. So think of it kind of like a stair step where it's actually going to overlap and that's what's going to act as a key that just runs the entire perimeter of the part. So again, this is all of this is tried and true methods that that have served me well and will serve you well if you uh, use them appropriately or accordingly. But again, if you skimp on your plaster bandages, if you try to make them too thin or if you use really low quality bandages, then this method will not work. Another reason to keep that water handy is so you can clean your hands so you don't have uh, plaster debris getting all over everything. And real important here is uh, to clean your hands here in this bucket of water rather than in your sink. If you try to wash your hands in a sink, you're going to plug up your plumbing. Okay, so our first half of our bandage shell has has cured and even using room temperature water this does not take long this typically takes about uh, maybe 10 minutes about 15 minutes for them to have uh, strength to be demolded so it doesn't take long at all now again just going to grab some of that on a chip brush some of the paste wax and you see because of that green tint it makes it easy to see where you've been and again want to make sure we get that across that seam but also right up against that edge where I've created that nice blocky seam. And that, that green tint definitely helps you apply that where it needs to go. Now unlike the the silicone, you can keep your uh, wax brush handy with your paste wax because that's pretty easy to rejuvenate as soon as it hits that wax so again. we're now ready to make our second half of our mold. 
And again, we're going to start with our long bandage. And again, we're going to fold that lengthwise. And what that does is that allows us to push that right up against that first bandage and it's going to overlap about a half inch to about three quarters of an inch over that first bandage. So you can see it a little better from the side there, but we want to make sure we get that just enough over that that it creates a little bit of an interlocking, kind of a snapping edge there. And again, play fill in the blanks here. Now I'm using this two and a half uh, quart bucket for my bandage water. Uh, sometimes I'll use a gallon bucket. The important thing to remember here is you see as the water starts to get more and more white, see our water starting to get more and more white, and gets that more of a, when it starts looking like whole milk, that's when it's time to get some new water. If you uh, keep using the water, even after it's uh, absorbed all that extra plaster water, it's not going to make your bandages stronger, quite the opposite. After a while, it'll stop having enough clean water to get a good reaction with your plaster bandages when you dip them. So make sure that you use plenty of clean water in here. And at the end of this mold, this is about as much as I'll try to get out of a, uh, out of a bucket like this. Again, if we keep going and you keep using that water, uh, it's not going to make things better and stronger. It's going to make for very weak bandages that are not going to cure properly because they're not going to have enough clean water reacting. And I'm just going to go ahead and use up this last piece of bandages and put that right here to reinforce that area. And there you go. Now we have our finished plaster bandage mother mold. We're going to let this sit for about 30 minutes and then come back and open up our mold. Our mother mold has set up and you can see that overlap there. If you keep that pretty clean throughout this, this whole process, the demold should be fairly simple. But if not, you can always take a, a straight edge tool and come back like a palette knife and clean up that edge. One of, one of the edges it should come off pretty easily. And there we have our finished mother mold. Now this is still a little bit green at this point, but you see how that goes together nicely and just snaps back together. But we're going to set that aside. And now it's time to make our incision here to, to demold our hand. Now to make this cut, I like to use a scalpel. Just real important to be conscious of where you're cutting and uh, keep your hands out of the way so you don't accidentally cut any mold maker. Now I don't necessarily have to key this cut. I can keep this relatively straight. but it sure doesn't hurt. If you were to want to build a keyway into this, you could definitely do that. And this is always a good use for your leftover silicone pores to make these old chunks like this. Okay. And if our mold design works as planned, then we should be able to just take this right off. <laughs> 
with little to no damage to our original. And then we could check the inside of this. And it looks like overall we got a nice bubble-free mold. So now ready to turn that back the right way. And you can see how that insert here goes right back together. And clean off that excess silicone. And we are now ready for casting. Cast up a resin, quick resin copy, just to clean the mold and just show you uh, give you an idea of how this seam is going to go back together and what kind of cleanup we're going to have on a hand cast like this. So first off, anytime we're molding something like this and then casting it, it's a good idea to remember that everything is going to be upside down when it's poured. So if you have your original handy where you can check it out, it's a good idea to flip that over so you can see exactly what's happening inside the mold. So overall, this is a pretty straight shot into all of these fingers and fingertips. So what we're looking for here is if there's any area where the hand comes back up like this and might uh, trap air bubbles in the fingertips. And if there is an area like that, it's not the end of the world. It just means we need to tip the mold a little bit and burp those air bubbles out of those spots. So this fingertip had a little bit in the original... Uh, alginate cast so we're going to need to watch for that but overall even that is is relatively minor and that we can address simply by just tipping the mold a little bit this way so just to be on the safe side we're going to mix up more resin than we absolutely have to have and i'm going to have another mold on standby just to accept that extra resin okay now the resin we're going to be using for this is the uh, tc 804 Jet Black. And the reason we're using this is, one, it's an open kit of resin I have handy, but also because it is the Jet Black resin formula, that uh, that will lend itself well to finishing. So if we want to put a metallic finish on our finished hand casting, having a black resin piece to, to finish makes a lot of sense for that. Now remember, any of the TC Jet Black series resins, they have a very dense uh, black pigment in the part B. So real important to make sure you shake that up each time before you use the resin. If you don't do that, you'll wind up with the resin looking a little bit more gray than rather than a true black. Now, just a quick word about my mold. I've got a mold strap around my plaster bandage shell and I've got everything realigned here. So I'm just going to set this down into a mixing bucket for casting. And now ready to measure out our resin components. Now TC804 has a working time of around uh, seven minutes at room temperature, and then a demold time around 45 minutes or so, depending on the cross section of the part. So we have more than enough time. If this is a really critical piece and we need to vacuum degas the resin, or if we have to pressure cast it, this is a perfect resin formula for that because it allows more than enough time for pressure casting or vacuum degassing or whatever the situation calls for. Now, because we don't have any seams on the outside perimeter of the mold, we don't have to worry about this leaking. Uh, the only area where we've got that seam is right here between the wrists of the piece. So that's the only area we've got to watch out for. Now what I'm going to do here is just take this and tilt it a little bit just to help burp any air bubbles out. And go ahead and fill that up the rest of the way. Okay, so we have our, our resin mixed up and poured into our mold and I used a little 
foam chunk there to level everything out. So we're gonna let this sit undisturbed and let that cure. Now, if you're new to casting resin like this, remember these mass casting systems are designed to cure in a thick mass, hence the name. So the thinnest areas will actually be the last to cure because they rely on the exotherm developing in that mass part of the, the casting. So areas like this, these thin puddles, those will be the last to cure, or these areas right up here will be the last areas to uh, cure completely. And this little mold of a nut that I have here, these little drips, again, will be the last place to cure. So this is always a good idea to keep an eye on a piece like this before we open up our part, because the main, area, the main reason you wanna be aware of that is if you're casting a part that has a thick base, and then you've got, uh, it's a statue that has little hands or fingertips outstretched. Remember that those hands and fingertips will be the last part to cure, whereas that thick base will be the first part to cure. So you want to be aware of that because if you uh, demold your part too fast, you could risk deforming those th really thin areas. So we're going to back off and let that set up. And again, we're going to use this little nut mold here to, uh, to check and make sure this is ready to demold. Okay, so it's about 45 minutes uh, or so later, and I'm gonna peel up a little bit of that drip. Again, remember that uh, your thinnest cross section will be the first area to demold. So, and just for fun, we're gonna go ahead and demold our, our resin nut and now we know that our resin hands are ready for demolding. Okay, so now we have our hand cast. This is a good time to look it over and just check for any leaks or any funky spots. Overall, our mold looks nice. And you see we got that nice smooth outside. And there we have our finished hand cast. Now our mold goes right back into our shell. And you can see our, uh, our little seam there between the wrists worked beautifully. We have just a very small amount of flashing. And again, we do have a little bit of a seam, but that's okay. That's going to be real easy to clean up there. So there is our finished hand cast. Okay, so here we have our finished hand cast in uh, TC804 Jet Black Resin, ready for any kind of finishing work that we need to do. This still is going to take a little bit of cleanup there at the, the seam and the bottom, but overall we have a really nice pristine cast, especially for this just being the first cast out of our mold. So uh, this is usually kind of the rough cast that might uh, get some of the garbage and dust and, and whatnot out of the mold, but you can see compared to our original, we have a very nice faithful reproduction. And again, at this point for a cast like this, I would typically uh, do a couple of things, either just dry brush some copper or bronze over the top, or I would use this with uh, metal powder to create a cold cast look with, uh, again, copper, brass, or bronze. But uh, in the video description, I'm gonna link to our page on resin finishing. Be sure to check that out in our video library page. So I'll put all of the links in the video description to all of the products we used in this, but most importantly, several other resources on finishing. So I didn't want to make this, this video is already running way long. So uh, those of you curious about some finishing techniques, be sure to check the uh, links in the video description for some resin casting tips, as well as just some finishing tips overall. So there we have our finished resin cast out of our PXP727Q mold.
So the, a mold like that, if uh, made properly and taken good care of, you could easily get several dozen casts out of that. Again, if everything is done dress right dress and you're careful with that mold. And like I said, in my personal library of molds, I actually have molds made the, using this particular technique, some of them as old as 20 years, uh, going back 20 years. So. Uh, Thanks again for watching. I know this was a little bit of a, a drawn out tutorial, but I wanted to make sure that some of those, those of you who've been asking about uh, this kind of approach for making a mold of a hand cast or that sort of application, I wanted to make sure uh, all of those questions were addressed that many of you have asked. So there you go. And again, remember that all the uh, links for all the products we use will be in the video description, so be sure to check those out. And most importantly, for those of you wanting to study up on additional techniques, I put some links to our uh, resin casting page and some of the finishing techniques page uh, also as part of our video library. And the video library, I know I go on and on about this, but uh, that allows us to compile a lot of our content on YouTube and uh, put a little better links to it and put it all together in one convenient place. So be sure to check that out. And of course, last little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And thanks again for watching. Again, we're coming up on almost 19 years, about it'll be 19 years this fall uh, that we've been operating Bitty Mold Supply and we couldn't have done it without you. We've been on YouTube for a while now. It's hard to believe we're coming up on 20 years. So thanks again for all of your support and thanks again for watching.